This conference will now be recorded. All right, good morning, everyone, and welcome. Uh, thank you for spending time with us this morning. I hope you have a great lineup of speakers for you today who are excited to share with you information to support your team and the work that you're doing. Uh, my name is Kimberly Cook, and I'll be the moderator for today. <clears throat> um, I work with, I'm the Northern California Business Development Manager for Agrimen Soil Products. And conveniently, since the topic today is about composting, I did want to mention that Agrimen is a commercial composter. Uh, and we assist jurisdictions throughout California, composting their organics. We serve in 200, and city, 200 cities throughout California and offer about 300 different types of eco-friendly soil products, all made with our compost. Uh, our host today is Ruth Abbey. She's the principal of Abbey & Associates, and she'll be doing all the background work to keep the webinar running smoothly today. Today's webinar is about composting which is session four of a 13-part webinar series brought to you for free by the Swana Gold Rush chapter in Northern California. Our webinar series occurs once a month on a Friday uh, from noon to 1 p.m. Pacific. <clears throat> These webinars are free to both members and non-members, so please let your friends and colleagues know about the series so they can join us as well. Check out our Swana Gold Rush chapter website on the events page to learn more about our webinar series. You can register for upcoming sessions here, find links to previous sessions, and learn more about opportunities to sponsor the webinar series. Now, if you're not currently receiving the webinar announcement emails from us uh, and you'd like to stay plugged in, send us an email at swanagoldrush at gmail.com. Also, would love to hear your feedback about today's webinar and ideas for future webinars and honestly, anything that's on your mind. So again, email us at swanagoldrush at gmail.com. Now, this webinar series is only made possible with the dedication and hard work of the SWANA webinar team members, which include Cecilia Rios with the City of San Jose, Tim Rabley of HDR Engineers, and Christine Wolf of Recology. If you have a SWANA certification that you need to maintain and you're registered for this webinar, you'll automatically receive a continuing education unit, also known as a CEU. Now, SWANA provides certification courses in landfill operations, composting programs, household ha hazardous waste, zero waste, and more. And I definitely encourage you to check out SWANA's website to learn more about our certification courses and get plugged in. SWANA, SWANA requires all those who are certified through one of our courses to obtain 30 CEUs across three years in order to maintain certification. So each of these webinars that you attend, you'll receive uh, one credit. This webinar series is also only made possible because of viewers like you uh, and through sponsorships. And so I'd like to give a sincere thanks to our sponsors for the webinar series so far, Rethink Waste, Salinas Valley Recycles, Recology, and HDR Engineering. And so for 15, a $15,000, excuse me, $1,500 sponsorship from your, your company will be highlighted as a premier sponsor in an individual webinar, receive a large company logo, uh, which will be included in all webinar marketing emails, as well as a Swana Gold Rush webinar series web page, uh, on the web page. Check out our website to learn more about ways you can sponsor or contact Christine Wolf of Recology for more information. Now, at this point, uh, we've all participated or viewed many webinars over the last few months. The platform we're using here is called GoToMeeting. Um, so I did want to draw your attention to how to use the platform a little bit so you'll be able to more easily participate in today's webinar. So the first thing is um, the default is it'll have everyone's pictures. And so this I'm referencing, if you are viewing the screen, you'll be able to see what I'm referring to. So it'll show everyone's picture pretty large as the initial default when you log in. Now, if you just wanna see the PowerPoint and not the little screens, you can go to this section here at the top, at the top center of the page where it says, uh, view who's talking and there's up down arrows and you can click and you can click hide everyone and you'll just view the PowerPoint. Additionally, if you'd like to submit questions or connect with Ruth or I, the host or the moderator, uh, known as organizers on the platform, you can send a chat and the chat is on the right hand column in the box. There's a bubble which I have circled here and then you have the option to click at the bottom whether you want the message to go to everybody um, or you can click and send it to specific people.
Now for the uh, for the attendees, if you can make sure that your mic is muted at all times and that your webcam is turned off. Our speakers for today are Jeff Hill, Brianna St. Pierre, and Matt Cotton. After each presenter has finished speaking, I will ask them a few questions uh, from the chat box, depending on the time available. So anyone who does have a question specific to that speaker, please make sure it's clarified for that speaker. At the end of the, all the speakers, any extra time, then I'll ask general questions at that point. And without further ado, our first speaker is Jeff Hill. Jeff Hill is a technical expert in the organic waste management sector. Jeff started his career in waste in the early 2000s. Uh, in the early 2000s with biofuels production. He completed his PhD in compost science in 2013 and was hired as engineering manager by Harvest Power and then promoted to general manager for the company's 240,000 ton per year AD and ASP compost facility near Vancouver, BC. After a stint as an independent process consultant, he joined engineered compost systems as a technical director responsible for preliminary facility de design, sitting, permitting, facility on it, source testing, odor modeling, and a host of other compost industry specific consulting and technical services. He's currently working for HDR as their organic management specialist. Jeff, thanks for joining us. All right, you're welcome. Can you hear me okay? I can hear you great. All right, so let's see if people wanna stare at me. Sometimes I wave my hands. Oh, that button's not working. I'll just leave it as it is. Okay, so uh, I'm gonna speak about uh, for 10 or 12 minutes today. Matt will probably keep me in check if I go over because I will be taking up his time. Um, so today we're gonna talk about uh, pretty fundamental stuff. Um, is composting um, aerobic and is your pile aerobic? So the outline, Let's go forward, here we go. We've got uh, kind of eight categories. Um, definition of composting, quite fundamental stuff. Uh, the definition of what aerobic, hypoxic, and oxic mean as process environmental conditions. How we can measure oxygen in our composting piles. Um, and then how we can calculate oxygen as a um, PPM, or parts per million, because that's what's uh, tied to the definitions of aerobic, et cetera and it has some sample data from a windrow facility, uh, windrowing green waste, and data after data for, of oxygen after turning a windrow. Um, our last section is gonna be uh, what to do to, to measure this data if you don't have the right probe, and then how to fix the problem sort of on a, on a broader scale. How do we increase the aerobic conditions within the pile? Is this going okay? Going good. Yeah. Okay, great, thanks. Okay, so uh, U.S. Composting Council in 2019, uh, with a lot of work um, from Ron Alexander and uh, and the team there, updated the definition of composting. This is an excerpt. So compost is the product manufactured through the controlled aerobic biological decomposition of biodegradable materials. So the important part here is bolded. It's aerobic. And prior. To 2019, the definition is actually quite broad. The biological decomposition of organic matter accomplished by mixing and piling in such way to promote aerobic or anaerobic decay. So the importance here, um, aerobic conditions convert the vast majority of the oxidizable carbon into CO2, and anaerobic decay uh, produces methane. We do not want to put methane up into the atmosphere. Um, that is the job of an anaerobic uh, digester, which are enclosed and has gas capture. The vast majority of composting, I'd say 99% of composting in the US is not covered or enclosed. So we don't even have a great definition of what does aerobic mean in the composting world, and I am proposing one right here. So Ecology, Ecology Society of America defines these conditions with respect to water. Uh, they use milligrams per liter. It's equivalent to parts per million. Aerobic is greater than two. If you have greater than two milligrams per liter of oxygen um, dissolved into the liquid, it's aerobic. Between one and two, it's hypoxic. This is where you start to have oxygen deficiencies. Oops, and I spelled anoxic wrong. Sorry about that. 
anoxic is less than 0.5 milligrams per liter oxygen. Um, this is reiterated by the USGS, US Geological Survey. These are environmental kind of conditions and the reactions that happen inside of an anoxic environment, um, uh, you know, is what uh, reduces um, the carbon into methane. So we're trying to avoid anaerobic reactions. And just to make the connection here, composting really happens in a liquid, happens at the biofilm um, of degrading organic matter. So you need some water in order to make the biofilm, biofilm is wet, the reactions happen inside of the wet medium. So on the right, we have uh, a couple little clods of compost with a little biofilm layer and free airspace between that to allow air transfer and oxygen to replenish the oxygen inside of the liquid film, the biofilm layer. This is kind of how composting happens. And, and some basics here, if you fill up that free air space totally with water, then you, you don't have good airflow. And if it's totally dry, you don't have a liquid film and your reactions, your aerobic reactions stop in both cases. So there's a sweet spot, generally about 60% average moisture content. So that you get a, li a liquid film and you get free air space. So what this means for oxygen, if we're trying to determine if our piles are aerobic, hypoxic or anoxic, we need to measure oxygen. There really is only one probe, and it's Rio Temp. It's a company down in Southern California. They make an excellent probe. It's called the OxyTemp. And it's the only probe on the market for composting piles. It samples free air. There's some sort of noise in the background there. Um, it samples free airspace. Uh, so it's reporting in a percent oxygen and it's pulling it up from some three or four foot deep, depending on which probe length you buy. And the report that it gives on the screen is in a percentage, as percentage of oxygen compared to ambient air. So ambient air is about 20%. The sensor's good, it's good for a year or two. It's pretty simple to maintain and clean. It's robust, I like the probe. It has a built-in temperature sensor. Sometimes I use a manual temperature sensor um, probe in, in addition to this, uh, the temperature sensor on the OxyTemp, just to double check and make sure I'm getting the right temperature read. Now, the question is, if you're that's reporting in a percentage and you need to get it to parts per million to actually understand what's happening there, there's a relationship between the oxygen as a percent and um, the parts per million of oxygen dissolved into the biofilm. And this is a relationship with temperature here. So if you think about beer or your favorite fizzy drink. You, it's fizzier when it's cold and you lose the bubbles when it warms up. Um, this is a pretty standard, uh, well-known relationship and uh, cooler water and thus your cooler composting piles will hold a higher concentration of oxygen. So you can calculate this with Henry's law or you can look at this handy dandy table that the UK, essentially the environment EPA out of the UK put together. Here it is on the next page. You, there's a good article in BioCycle all about this as well. So what this did is to just calculate the middle values all colored in different bands is the oxygen as it parts per million based on the oxygen and percentage on the left that you've read out of your Rio temp oxy temp meter and the temperature in Celsius is on the top. Obviously, if you're doing this in Fahrenheit, just change those to Fahrenheit. Now you have a Fahrenheit chart. And um, what I did with the lines and the labels is I just used the definition of uh, the conditions for anoxic, which are less than one, um, oh, less than 0.5. I should move the line down a little bit. Hypoxic is between one and two. Aerobic uh, is greater than two. And there's really a target safe zone, which is greater than three parts per million. So the recommendation out of this paper was to keep food waste composting greater than three parts per million and green waste composting could be done at greater than two parts per million without excessive odor. Um, okay, so just a quick bit of data um, to uh, check in on my guess is that most composting, most windrow composting facilities go into the anoxic state. Um, this is about a 60-day process. 
you can see it starts aerobic probably while the particles are nice and large and then as they decompose as the turner goes through again and again and again the particle size decreases and eventually you end up higher temperatures and lower oxygen resulting in anoxic conditions and um, here's another example of oxygen consumption in a, in a very short period of time after turning so really it, this shows that within 15 minutes the process has become anoxic where anaerobic reactions will predominate so what does this mean um, we need to measure it in order to know really we need a, a probe the oxytemp probe is the best one you can buy it from rio temp the price is 2100 to 2300 depending on length um, this can be prohibitively expensive for someone just wanting to check and so in some discussions recently with the uscc and the ccref who own a probe they may be willing to rent the probe to uscc members they are debating it right now so one of the tenets that I always bring forward in presentations like these is that we need more data. The industry needs a whole lot more data and a lot of data sharing, which sometimes is difficult with um, mostly private facilities uh, composting most of the waste in the United States. So is it a problem? Um, two thirds of the US composting facilities uh, are windrows and some of that data that I showed, but a lot of the data that I have is the majority of these windows go anoxic quite fast, and thus they are not certainly not food waste compatible. Um, so most of the infrastructure really can't compost food waste, may already be anoxic, and anaerobic reactions produce 10 to 1,000 times more odor, NCH4, than a fully aerobic process. Uh, 1380, SP 1383 could generate 20 million tons of food waste, with the majority of facilities not able to process it without generating odor and, and methane. Food waste, and the reason for this, food waste consumes oxygen much faster than green waste. Much of green waste is lignin, which does not decompose quickly. And a lot of food waste is sugary proteins and fats that we haven't eaten, and they do decompose rapidly. So finally, fixing the problem, after we've measured it, if we've found that we're hypoxic or anoxic a lot of the time we need to uh, get into the aerobic zone and you get into the aerobic zone both by providing more air which entrains with it oxygen um, and we need to reduce the temperature so the simple things here if you have just immediate changes you can make limit the amount of food waste you limit the amount of oxygen is consumed you can keep the particle size large as large as possible um, still grinding and shredding is important, but keeping three or four inch size chunks allows more air transfer and can bring the air in and provide a little bit better cooling. You can have smaller, lower piles. You could convert the windrow to an aerated static pile. And with the aerated static pile, make sure the design and the capability of it actually can provide cooling. So this little chart on the right side, which happy happy to share around afterwards, shows this curve. Now the aeration rate is on the bottom. So as you go from left to right, you're increasing the aeration rate. And the pile temperature usually goes first up and then down as you increase the aeration rate. Because on the low end, you're providing oxygen needed for those reactions and you start oxidizing and generating heat. You have to get over the hump to start pulling away more of that heat than you're making. So if, you, if you're on the left side, you're not even close to providing enough air for cooling or oxygenating. So you have to be on the right side, such that as you increase the air, you decrease the temperature. And that is it. Great, thanks, Jeff. And um, so the uh, I think some of the noise was coming from the background of Jeff. Just so the audience knows, we did mute everybody else, but I think that noise will go away here shortly. Jeff, you probably have some banging in your background. I'm wondering. Oh yeah, yeah. I, there is some construction happening in my place. Um, yep. Yep. No, no worries. Uh, so that is where the noise is coming from. And our next speaker is Brianna. So Brianna St. Pierre is the senior engineering geologist at the State Water Resources Control Board, responsible for the agriculture, biosolids, composting, and land disposal programs. 
Prior to working at the State Water Board, Brianna worked for two regional water boards and also worked in environmental remediation consulting, geophysical consulting, and mining. Brianna has a BS in geophysics from the University of California, Riverside, and an MBA from Penn State. Brianna, thanks for joining us. Thank you so much for having me. Um, so as mentioned, I'm Brianna St. Pierre. I'm with the State Water Board, and today I'm here to talk about revisions to the general um, composting order. If I could figure out how to advance my slides. There we go. Okay, um, so the composting general order was adopted in August 2015, and we heard from stakeholders that there, there were just a lot of um, things that were confusing in there and things that needed to be modified. And so after a series of stakeholder meetings, the general composting order was adopted um, with revisions on April 7th of this year. And those revisions are really going to be the focus of my discussion today. So this slide is what I like to call a compost in a nutshell. Generally, the order requires no flooding of the site, no ponding, and no runoff. Whether a facility would be in tier one or tier two really depends on what feedstocks are being accepted at a site, um, the volume that's on site, and the site characteristics. In addition to the tier one requirements, tier two also has requirements for the, um, the pads and the ponds. There is an option for conducting groundwater monitoring in lieu of the hydraulic conductivity requirements for the pads. The comments that we were getting about the order were really focused on manure and really to these two issues. One, the um, what we heard from stakeholders was that manure should be allowed as a feedstock in tier one. And there was a lot of questions about whether manure was allowed um, to be composted at a, a site and still be eligible for the agricultural exemption. So we heard those issues loud and clear, and we revised the order. Um, the first one being that manure can now be allowed as a feedstock in tier one, as long as a groundwater monitoring and protection plan is implemented. Uh, the tier one size limits still apply. That's, 25,000 cubic yards of material on site at any time. Um, and the second issue that the revisions to the composting order really focused on was the agricultural exemption. In the 2015 order, a, for example, an orchard could have its prunings composted on site, applied back to their own fields and not need to comply with the requirements of the general order. Um, but they couldn't accept, say, for example, manure from the dairy next door to get their carbon nitrogen ratio to where they wanted it to be. They could only compost what was generated on their own site. And that really wasn't the intent of the general order. Um, they had to remain separate. And so under the new order, we really brought all of that together. Um, this slide really shows the difference, be the major differences between the agricultural exemption um, under the 2015 order and what is required under the revisions adopted earlier this year. So in 2000, under the 2015 order, the agricultural exemption, like I said, could only allow for composting on-site materials and now materials can be um, brought in from off-site. Um, with that, the volume, there wasn't a volume restriction under the 2015 order for this exemption. It was really limited by what was generated on site. Since material is now allowed to be brought in from off site, um, the agricultural exemption now limits the volume on site 
to the same volume as tier one, which is 25,000 cubic yards of material. This exemption also now requires best management practices to be implemented. Under the 2015 order, they, um, there was only 1,000 cubic yards that was allowed to be sold or given away to still qualify for the agricultural exemption. And that is now revised to allow up to 5,000 cubic yards per year. And that's consistent with the small volume composting exemption. The other change that we did to this order was we changed the title. Um, a lot of our comments that we got focused on applicability to agricultural operations and really the intent of this order is to focus on requirements for commercial composting operations. There are exemptions in there highlighting agricultural operations, but really the intent of the requirements for tier one and for tier two are targeted towards commercial composting operations. And so this, the addition of this one word really got to the intent of the order. Um, this is the question that we have received probably more than any other question on the order. And since I've had a cow on just about every single slide so far, I really wanted to highlight this point. Um, if a, if an operation is composting and they have an order which has requirements, this is from the water board perspective, has requirements for that operation, whether it's for a dairy or whether the operation is occurring, for example, at a landfill, there generally doesn't need to also be enrollment under the composting order as well. Um, I, I just really wanted to highlight that point because there was a lot of confusion. It's not our intent really to have enrollment in multiple orders for the same activity or to have any conflicting requirements. So while I had your attention, I wanted to really highlight that point. Um, the other thing before I turn this over is um, we are developing a tool that um, someone could go online and answer a series of questions and they could figure out if they were going to be in tier one or tier two for our requirements. We are developing it in um, collaboration with CalRecycles. So that same tool would be able to help that person figure out whether they would be, um, what, no, what tier they would also be in for CalRecycles purposes. Um, that should be out hopefully by the end of this year. And I also want to thank Ember Christensen for all of the work that she did on this. I'm just the, the speaker, the figurehead, and Ember really did all of the work on this. Our phone numbers are highlighted on here, but since we're all working remotely, the best way to contact us is via email. So with that, I will turn it over to Kimberly. Awesome. Brianna, thanks very much. And just a reminder for everybody, um, you can submit your questions via chat, and uh, after Matt's done with his presentation, we'll go through the questions. So Matt Cotton has spent 30 years in the composting industry. He's permitted and helped develop some of the major facilities throughout California, and has worked on numerous stateside <clears throat> excuse me, projects for CalRecycle. He spent almost two decades on the U.S. Composting Council board, including three terms as president, and was the lead instructor for the U.S. Composting Council's 40-hour compost operator training course, which, by the way, I'll put in a plug for, I've attended, and it's great, and I strongly encourage others to attend. He's the main author of Tawana's Organics Collection and Manager of Composting Programs courses, and here's a fun fact for you. Uh, both Jeff Hill and Matt are working together on a new CalRecycle VOC emissions project from a composting study. Matt, thanks for joining us. Thank you, Kimberly. Thanks for having me. Um, and for those of you who've been uh, able to sit through other uh, this entire uh, web series, you might remember I just did one of these. And uh, so this is not my talk. Uh, this is a talk uh, written, conceived, and delivered by Neil Edgar. Um, unfortunately, our friend Neil had some relatively unexpected uh, end of dodger that he's undergoing at the moment. So I guess he figured if he was going to be in pain I should also have to be in pain by delivering his talk. But um, if you enjoy this, <laughs> by all means, um, thank Neil. 
Uh, it's a it's a nice talk. It's well organized. Um, if you don't like it, I will take full responsibility <laughs> for not delivering it properly. Um, but yeah, unfortunately, Neil could not be here. Neil works uh, tirelessly for the California Compost Coalition, which is a lobbying coalition. Uh, primarily represents composters, actual operators. Uh, does a lot of spends a lot of time in Sacramento working with uh, regulators and others trying to promote. Uh, healthy sustainable composting and uh dealing with them, a number of the issues that come up uh from time to time um this talk is about compostable packaging issues um and you know it's <laughs> it's it's a really granular talk it's really hard to do in in 10 or 12 minutes um so if you're interested in this topic i certainly recommend you look up some of the resources that are available um look at the Biodegradable Products Institute, some other places. It's it's a super granular talk. It goes off in a lot of directions. Uh, excuse me, it's a super granular topic that can go off in a lot of different directions. I'm going to talk about some of the challenges from a composter perspective, but there are other challenges, of course, as well. So I'm going to talk about uh, initiatives composters have brought up, challenges with identification, both to the consumer as well as to the composter, some of the confusion that's out there talk a little bit about performance and a little bit about organic status. I was just talking to a colleague about this and this is a really vexing challenge. I've been involved or tracking compostable packaging since about the mid 90s, 96, 97. Uh, got really excited about uh, NatureWorks, some of the stuff they were doing. Got a chance to see their facility. We did some all sorts of meetings. I just thought it was a really interesting uh, chemistry and it is, uh, but there are some challenges and it, it seems as if we're talking about the same challenges uh, over the years. And, and we've made some progress on some of them, but some of them remain and new ones have come up. So um, again, if this is gonna be a solution or something you're spending some time on, then, then I urge you to educate yourself on the various aspects of it. Um, you know, a lot of this is coming about, uh, we've got these very ambitious uh, diversion goals here in California. So we think, gosh, we should go to where the food is and there's all this food service packaging and some jurisdictions have mandatory ordinances. In most cases, there was very limited or almost no participation by composters where the stuff ends up. And I think that's really one of the challenges uh, that the industry, the brands are out there, the manufacturers are out there, the jurisdictions are out there, um, certainly the generators of food, the restaurants and the uh, universities and the large venues that want to do something different and they look at compostables as an opportunity. Um, and again, it's just, it got really granular, really fast. Um, there's a fair amount of greenwashing. Um, there were a whole lot of confusion over terms like biodegradable and plant-based and made from plants, uh, a lot of lookalikes. Um, many of these products cost more. So there was a, an incentive to maybe upplay the benefits a little bit more than, than they should have. Um, we've had some luck uh, railing, reeling some of that in in California, but it's still out there and it's still a challenge uh, with people making claims for things that uh, really aren't easily to substantiate. The big issues um, impacting compost, I'm gonna add a fourth at the end. I didn't wanna change Neil's talk because this is his talk and I want to sort of maintain the integrity of it, but I'll bring up a fourth issue at the end. But identification is one of the big ones. How do you tell uh, what this stuff is? How do we tell consumers that? Uh, are they going to spend a lot of time looking at that lid and the straw and the cup and the plate and God knows the fork? Um, and I think that's an easy one for people to understand. You've all probably been to a coffee shop or a, a forward thinking a uh, quick serve restaurant and seen some compostable stuff and looked at it and maybe tried to understand which bin it was supposed to go in, uh, maybe successfully, maybe unsuccessfully. And we focus on that and that's important Then we have tools to deal with that. But it's also about identification for the processors and how the sorters at the MRF at the compost facility are supposed to understand this stuff in a relatively quick, in, you know, in a three second decision window of pulling it off a belt or pulling it off the floor. Um, so that's one issue, or it's two issues all surrounding identification. Um, you know, making everything green is, is one opportunity, but it really doesn't stop, you know, this being America, it's hard to, 
tell one customer they can use green and nobody else can. So, and maybe if you're a McDonald's, you don't like green because you've spent decades honing a, a yellow and red logo and vice versa. So that's big challenge number one. Uh, performance, is it gonna break down? Is it gonna break down in different composting systems? As Jeff said, actually, I think he's a little bit conservative. Actually, uh, easily 80 plus percent of the composting in the US is windrow composting. Um, and there's a great deal of variation as far as how long, what the retention time is for that. Um, we don't have a backyard or community composting standard, but some of those programs are accepting some of these materials. There is a European standard for that. Uh, there are some issues with aerated static piles, as Jeff talked about, while the, you may have, uh, as he said in his excellent talk, that there are opportunities to do a really great job with ASP composting as far as aeration and moisture, you do get less agitation, which is one of the mechanisms that helps break some of this stuff down. So not a lot of testing with that. We've done um, a reasonable amount of in-situ testing, but nowhere near the amount we need to really understand what those parameters are that these things break down most readily under. And then finally, organic status, um, particularly here in California, we sell um, I just did a study for Tower Cycle affirming once again that agriculture is the single biggest market for compost. I don't know, we didn't break that down by organic, but selling compost to certified organic is a significant market for composters um, all over the country, particularly in California, or I'd say particularly along the West Coast. Even composters who aren't selling to organic per se like to get their products uh, certified, approved, pre-approved through organizations like OMRI or CDFA's organic input material uh, program. So that is a, a, an imprimatur that composters like and find value in. And at the moment, uh, under the National Organic Program, uh, compostables are seen as synthetic and not allowed. There's some gray area there, whether or not you remove them or not, and some other things. Um, it's not really what the NOP was designed for, but um, there's been a struggle to see whether or not if you use compostable plastics in a composting stream, whether or not you can then sell that compost for organic. In most cases, you can't unless you're removing them uh, at some point along the stage, which sort of defeats the whole value proposition. Um, some composters, this is a document, which is I know is really, really hard to read, but you can Google the Oregon compost letter. Uh, the biggest composters in Oregon said, hey guys, you know, we looked at this stuff, we've tried it, just isn't working. I urge you to look at this and get some of their perspective, um, you know, in the Oregon market, um, largely, well, for a lot of different reasons. Um, you can read that for yourself if you just Google Oregon compost letter, but um, the composters in Oregon, including some very large companies, you see the logos there, kind of taking a stand that kind of taking a time out a little bit on compostable plastics. Um, on the other end, you've got some of the folks who uh, were working at Cedar Grove, one of the early adopters of compostable plastics going out on their own, creating a, a manufacturer's alliance of some of the bigger composters to do field testing and try to understand a little better about how these materials work in the real environment, in actual composting sites, doing a bunch of in-situ testing. So there is work being done and, and there will continue to be work being done on uh, degradability and retention time and what factors influence that. So there is work being done by the, the CMA and others. Um, U.S. Composting Council has a, an open source method to deal with that as well. But let's look at identification really quickly. I mean, you know, it's always fun to look at pictures of food waste and, you know, is it food like the pictures on the left or is it, you know, all the stuff that helps deliver food and that can be an awful lot of packaging. Um, there's some evidence to suggest certainly that using uh, allowing uh, the packaging to be thrown away with the food does increase the total amount of food generated, although there isn't enough data on that. And sometimes it's not, the studies aren't terribly robust in the sense that if you add packaging to food, you get packaging plus food. That's not more food necessarily. It's just a total higher weight, but you get the idea. Um, and that's on the consumer side on the, you know, again, on the customer side, or excuse me, on the processor side, you know, looking at, some recent pictures of facilities in California, you know, which, which of that stuff is compostable? How easy is that to determine that? Do you want to create a system that will just pull all the plastic out of that, which looks, which is also challenging, or can you actually figure out a way to get the compostables out of that? So there are challenges with identification, particularly at, at the MRF and composting side. Um, here are some easy tests, you know, which of this 
which of these are compostable? Okay, you got, you got it, are you clear? Okay, we all know which ones are compostable? Okay, good. There weren't any copycats there, right? Those are all compostable? No, they're not. So again, challenges. Um, some of these uh, vendors, uh, plastic and cup uh, manufacturers have both lines. They have lines that look re remarkably similar, whether they are or aren't compostable. So there are lots of challenges with uh, creating and branding and helping the consumer to identify these materials. Um, Washington State put a, a bill out uh, last year that tries to restrict uh, the marketing. We'll see how that goes. Um, we've got a couple other uh, similar efforts here in California with uh, AB 2287, um, which is uh, sitting on the governor's desk. So it did pass. It got uh, modified, I should say. So it's not quite as robust as uh, Washington is, but we are trying to work on that. Um, there's several other bills, of course, um, everyone knows AB 1080 and SB 54 died in committee. And so we're expecting to see um, uh, uh, a similar language or maybe similar approach to reducing uh, plastics in the environment and making more of them compostable, recyclable. Uh, probably a, my best information seems to think that will be showing up uh, by uh, 2022, uh, it was allowed to, and it is expected, let me use the word expected, to uh, end up on uh, on the, the ballot uh, in 2022, or they're expected to qualify by March of next year. There was some extension that was allowed for that. Um, and uh, the other thing is SB 1335, which passed a few years ago and is being debated, we're sh we should be getting regulations out on AB 1335. Uh, soon, within a few weeks, um, and this is going to have a pretty big impact about how the the bill is really about, and the regulations are about how cow recycle, how the state purchases compostable packaging and recycling recyclable and compostable packaging, um, and the definitions they end up with are probably going to have a huge impact on uh, how compostables and recyclables are sold and used in California. So you might want to pay attention to that one. Um, yeah, again, uh, 1080, 1080 did not pass. Um, there are some uh, model compostable plastics labeling uh, templates on the USCC website. These are probably more for other states rather than California. Uh, we have some similar language already in California. Um, but you know, you get situations like this. Um, where does my cup go again? Is it compostable? Is it organic? Where does it go? Um, a lot of challenges with identification and, and outreach, I guess. Um, again, I mentioned performance. Uh, yes, there's an ASTM standard. That's a lab-based standard. Uh, it's a perfectly good standard for proving consistency of a material type. Maybe it's not the best standard for uh, an actual in-process uh, compost manufacturing facility. Generally, windrows have a 90 day plus cycle, uh, but covered ASP, the types of composting we're developing and Jeff showed some pictures of are on much shorter cycles, particularly along the West Coast in places where land's expensive. So we are trying to compost uh, faster and, and maybe as Jeff said, uh, maximizing uh, your consistency with compost performance indicators is gonna help you do that. But regardless, it's, it's making it much more challenging for these materials to break down the time they were expected to, um, we are doing some anaerobic digestion. We're building those plants. A couple more of those got grants in the most recent round of GGRF funding. Uh, don't know how those break down there. Generally, they're, the retention times are even shorter, you know, 15, 21 days, et cetera. Um, and the thickness, the composition, is it paper bonded to a, a PLA liner, the formulation, all those things matter as far as how these things actually break down or at least how they perform in the environment or in the composting environment. Um, and finally, um, trying to wrap up, contamination is a big one um, physically in terms of uh, trying to figure out compostable versus non-compostable. Um, but also um, this issue is a relatively recent one with fluorinated compounds um, and basically grease barriers added to food contact thing. It's in a lot of things, right? Obviously, PA, PFAS is an issue for all sorts of things, including leachate from landfills and wastewater treatment plants, but specifically on 
uh, as a grease barrier on food, it's a challenge. Uh, certainly not going to be uh, really exciting to the organic folks. So uh, BPI has some answers to that. They seem to be uh, restricting rather significantly uh, the use of PFAS in their members' products, but they don't speak for the entire industry. So yet another concern uh, we want to get away from. I don't actually think the PFAS issue is as big a concern to composters. I think it's, I think it's what I mean by that is it's a larger issue that's going to get solved, not because the composters are concerned about it, but because the larger universe is concerned about it. Um, it's a real issue in water quality nationwide, if not internationally. So um, I wanted to add too um, that Neil doesn't have in here, but I think it's an emerging issue just to wrap up quickly. Um, we've started to use uh, depackaging equipment uh, in composting, both at uh, MRFs and transfer stations and at composting sites and at AD facilities. Uh, equipment that was really designed for, you know, loss prevention in manufacturing facilities to take, say, a, a case of past eight peas and separate the box and the cans from the peas. Um, and these things work really well. And uh, a number of composters and AD facilities have installed these. Power Cycles provided funding to install these at some sites. And what they do is really separate out or do the best they can to separate out the food from the packaging, from particularly plastic. They're really good at getting out film plastic. Um, they're somewhat good about getting out some paper, depending on the scale of it. Some paper is going to get through, but um, you know, the chances of a compostable cup or a fork uh, getting through these packages is pretty slim. And that has nothing to do with any of the, the challenges I just brought up, except it's another gauntlet that these materials have to go through in order to get to the composting site and actually you know complete their value chain so just yet another challenge to doing this not to sound negative uh, i think these materials have some some promise and are very interesting in some situations but there are some real challenges and, and with that i'll turn it back to uh i'm going to turn it back to uh kimberly okay matt uh, matt thanks so much for presenting and thanks to all of our presenters for presenting today. I'll switch over to questions. I've, I've had a few come in. I'm going to start with two here. Um, let me give me one second. All right. So the first question is, um, will we have enough capacity to meet the statutory requirements? What are the barriers from the point of view of the composters? So I'll put in a quick point there as a composter uh, regarding the barriers. So permitting has definitely always been a huge issue <clears throat> as it relates to permitting composting sites, landfills, and similar. Um, it depends on the county, uh, depends on the type of solid waste or the, the type of permit the composter is looking for, and the air, air board and water board and that sort. And I'm sure Matt can go into more detail on regards to capacity. Um, and that would, Matt, you may have a, a a bird's eye view of that. I'll say as it relates to Agriman, we definitely have capacity throughout the state. Um, Matt, what's your thought overall? Yeah, that's really great to hear, Kimberly. Um, I just did a study, well, I say just did, it was a, probably a year and a half ago, uh, published a study for Cal Recycle looking at uh, that very question. It was, it's called the SB 1383 uh, huh, Survey of Market Conditions and Infrastructure. Infrastructure and Market Conditions. Anyway, it's on their website. Um, I think it's the most cited report in their recent 1383 report, but it looks, I, I talked to all the composters, the big ones, and, um, you know, it, it, it's tricky on a statewide basis. I agree with you. We have the capacity and, but I, I get, a, I've gotten a fair amount of, uh, criticism about that because it, it's, it turns out, I looked into this, it's a big state. And so while we do have facilities with capacity in some places, that's not universally true. Um, you know, uh, and so some people are like, oh, why don't we have one up in, why, why don't we have more capacity in MODOC? You know, um, so I guess, and I, I don't mean to be flip about it, but um, I think my conclusion from having done these types of surveys now for a decade and a half, it's not, the capacity is not the real question. And, and I know, again, some people aren't gonna like to hear this, but it's not as if we have trucks of food waste you know, post-1383 food waste running around looking for somewhere to go. Um, you know, we didn't have, we didn't say, oh man, if only we had Starbucks, we could get a good latte. You know, people started, anyway. <laughs> Once we start collecting food, I think you're gonna find that companies like yours, other companies around the state 
jurisdictions are going to start developing composting sites. Um, there are a lot of projects happening right now. There are a lot of people waiting on capacity. They're waiting for collection programs. We're not, it's not, and, and Brianna made, didn't really talk about the general order in, in, in totality. She talked about some of the changes, which was great. But the general order plus different air district rules have really made it challenging to the point you really can't build a facility and hope it hope that the feedstock comes. You have to have the feedstock contract understanding. So once, when and if, and of course with COVID things are slowing down, but when and if we start collecting these materials, when and if we jurisdictions start adding food waste to their yard waste and taking that perhaps to a composting site as opposed to a chip and grind site or a biomass plant, you're gonna see capacity increase. There's a lot, if Neil were here, uh, Neil would say he knows about lots of projects that are sort of in the back pockets of a number of uh, haulers just waiting to have that tap turned on, but it's it's not tapped on. It's a chicken and egg thing. Um, mm -hmm. And I think I'm, I'm going with the chicken at this point. We need more collection programs and the capacity will take care of itself. 100% and Matt, I couldn't agree more on that. The, um, the infrastructure will be built when there's an awareness that the jurisdictions are ready for their organics to be managed. Um, so until that happens, it might be a bit slower to get some of the expanding capacity online. So I definitely encourage jurisdictions and cities who know that they're going to need to ramp up their programs in the coming months, get, how, get those talks started now because that'll help move industry along as well. Uh, thank you, Matt. Now it looks like the questions that I have coming in so far are for Matt, but let me see. Um, okay, I've got one here. Can the speakers address the conflicting goals of the three primary regulatory agencies, Cal Recycle, the Water Board, and Air Districts, regarding the need for elevated food waste diversion? I'll let anyone jump in and start with that. Rihanna, you're one, you're one of those three agencies. You want to jump in on that? I I am one of those three agencies. Um, so I I'm hesitant to call them conflicting goals, but we definitely have different purviews, and we do hear loud and clear, um, especially when we start talking about the requirements for the air districts, the challenges there. Um, as I mentioned at the end of my talk, um, we are trying to develop a tool to help streamline the permitting process for water boards and cow recycle and what that will do is not only help streamline that permitting process but also help clarify um, the requirements and the apparent discrepancies between the requirements from the two different agencies um, we in that tool we don't have the air districts included in that there is an effort going on right now it's just getting started to incorporate the requirements from the air districts into a tool that can um, help navigate that effort a little bit so looking at it from the air district requirement and then if you're in whichever bin then this is what your permitting would look like for cow recycling for the water boards like i said it's just getting started and it is at this point more geared towards on farm composting um but there's room for expansion there but like i said it's just getting started so i don't really want to say that they're necessarily conflicting goals um our our global goals are protecting the environment we are all part of cali pa it is just um trying to navigate the permitting and we we do hear that and so we're trying to come up with tools to um help streamline that process and this is jeff just to chime in i mean cal recycle is doing some work to try and um uh work together with the air boards on the on the project that uh, matt and i are working on which is um hdrs uh, investigation into emissions related to composting process. So I wouldn't say they're totally disparate. Thanks, Jeff. Any thoughts, Matt? No, I, I agree completely. I think Brianna had, had an excellent answer. I, I agree with Jeff 100%. I mean, I think in some ways, you know, we're embarking on a new adventure although we've been composting for a long time in california now we're talking about adding food waste uh, these are big uh, complicated uh, facilities with 
with impacts. And so it's not easy to cite them. It's not easy to permit them. Um, there are various agencies involved. I don't think they have, as Brianna said it very well, better than I'm saying it, they're not disparate goals, they're just different goals. The Water Board's goal is to protect clean water. The Air Board's job is to minimize impacts on air. So the, sure. the fact is it's hard to permit stuff in California. It's hard to permit a gas station. And then I guess, with all due respect to the questioner, uh, yeah, it's hard to permit stuff in California. It's a big state, a lot of people in it. Um, if you're having a lot of trouble permitting it, it might not be a very good site. Um, really good projects that are well-funded and properly cited tend to get built. Um, I understand it's challenging. Uh -huh. You have to go through a lot of work, a lot of due diligence, but um, that's true for just about anything. Try citing an airport in California you think composting sites are <laughs> And I also want to add on to that, um, and it also adds to the prior question too, is when you're trying to permit a facility, I really highly suggest reaching out to your local entities, whether it's the LEAs or your local air districts or your regional water board as early as possible so that you can work out some of those requirements on the front end so it helps your permitting process go that much more smoothly. Totally, that makes sense. And we're just coming up upon the hour here. I'm gonna take one more question. Deep, do you want to ask a question so uh, we can unmute? And after this question, we'll go ahead and end. Hi, uh, this question is for Matt and Jeff. Um, my question is that it's if we all understand that food waste, food waste is not compatible with windrows and converting windrows to CASP is not only way more expensive. It's a very long permitting process. But when we have two third of our composting operations in windrows, then what's the solution? Like, I'm like, for me, it's it's, it's we all understand. Unfortunately, you're breaking up a little bit. What are the challenges here? Well, it's hard to get a permit. It takes maybe the um, maybe she can send an email afterwards because it is breaking up a little bit. Well, the gist of her question is, what do we do? Or you know, we have all this food waste now. And the infrastructure right now can't handle it. And I don't think there is a quick and easy answer or response. We need a multi-prong approach. We need to fast track the science and engineering behind composting. It needs to be, become picked up by engineering companies. Um, part of the reason why I'm with HDR. Um, we need the permitting uh, people to also educate and, and get educated on the actual things that are important in process control. Uh, which is a job that CalRecycle is helping with, <laughs> with the project with Matt and I, um, and maybe a slowdown of, you know, the, the important <laughs> timeline for getting food waste composted by, because uh, the infrastructure is not there. Any other comments from the panelists? Okay, and with that, Deepthi, I, I know that uh, part of your question got cut off, but you can definitely follow up with the speakers and, and talk more about the, the particular question. I'm sorry to any of the questions that we didn't get to, and I just wanted to give a sincere thanks to all the speakers. It takes time, effort, and energy to put these presentations together and take time out of your day to present them, so thank you very much to them, and thanks for, to everyone for joining the webinar. We'll have our next webinar here next month. Um, check out our website at Swana NorCal on the events page. You'll be able to see all of the previous recordings and see the upcoming webinars. And thanks again. Have a great rest of your day. Thanks, Kimberly. Great job. Thank you.